Good morning. Welcome to our services today. We're glad you've chosen to be here, making a conscious effort to join hearts and minds as we seek the face of Christ. Hope you'll take a moment, if you're a guest of ours, there is a yellow t uh, card in the pew in front of you, if you would fill that out so that we can have a record of your attendance with us. If you have folks come in and sit with you that you do not recognize after you introduce yourselves to them, if they are guests, ask them to fill out the card as well. That's also a prayer request card if you have special requests. Now as we listen to the prelude, let's turn our attention toward the risen Savior as we seek to worship together.
How majestic is your name in all the earth, Lord. We praise your name. God, please bless our gathering this morning. Have us accept your salvation and forgiveness so that we may experience your love and grace and peace. May all we say and do here today be a reflection of our love and worship to you. Lord, these are the desires of my heart, and I ask them in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. I'm glad you're here this morning. Let me ask you something. Do people ask your opinion of things? Do people ask you for your advice much? Yes. When I was a kid, I always wanted them to ask my advice on things because I had lots of ideas. You know that? But one day, my dad called me, and I was not a kid. I was a little older. My dad called me and asked my opinion of something. He said, Jimmy, what should we do about this? And I started thinking about it. The only time I'd ever been asked about anything was when they'd say, well, where do y'all want to eat dinner tonight or something? But you know, I even learned from that. When the question is asked, what do you have to have happen up in your mind up here? You have to think about not just what I want for dinner, but what, well, is my brother like this or not? Is my other brother like this or not? What is my mom like? What do, we, what do we have last night? You have to think about a lot of other things when you make a decision like that. So it's not just a matter of just do anything you want to. You consider other things too. Do you know there's a story in the Bible when God spoke to a brand new king named Solomon? And guess what happened? God said, Solomon, I'm glad you're king. Tell me what you want me to do. God asked Solomon what he wanted him to do. And Solomon had a chance to ask for anything he wanted. And guess what? Solomon didn't think about what he wanted. He didn't think about what would make him rich. He didn't think about what would make him powerful. You know what he thought about? It was real simple. He said, I've got a big responsibility. Will you help me do what I'm supposed to do with my responsibility as king. Now that's the way we ought to think. When you have a chance to influence a decision, you think not just about yourself, not just about what you like or don't like, you think broader than that about how it will affect other people around you. And you know what that's the mark of? A person who is maturing inside and who understands the importance of their giving someone else advice. That's something we learn. So Solomon teaches us that lesson, and God was pleased with it. So let's have a prayer together and ask God to always help us when we can influence somebody else to influence them in the right way. Okay? Sound good? Let's pray together. Dear God, we look forward to times when people want to know what we think about things. Help us to be honest and balanced to think about others, not just ourselves, and to always give those answers in love and in faith. We know what you expect. Help us to always want to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.
This is Kelly Henry. She's one of our court scholars. Our court scholars are back. She's from Swainsboro, Georgia, and she's preparing for a, and she's uh, the artist diploma at a program at Swobe School at uh, CSU. And uh, we're glad you're here. Thank you for sharing your gifts. She'll be with us through this year as one of our court scholars. Would you bow with me as together we pray? You bring so many things into our lives, O oh Lord. The beauty of music and the wonder of lives as they accept you as Savior. We see from even this morning, from baptism all the way through uh, children down front to worship, to individuals who are here, individuals who've had long experience with the church and those who are new to the fellowship. All of us have a place at your table and are blessed by your Holy Spirit. You come to us and you allow us to be who we are. And you encourage us to grow in who we are in you. And you bless that by allowing us to be a part of a world around us and make a difference there. So that those who are sick feel the blessings of your grace and love. Those that grieve find comfort. Those that are lonely find peace and engagement. Those who have needs in other ways find those needs met in missions. Those who, who just are in life going through transitions find people to walk with them through that. So many things. And you've allowed us as a church family to be a part. May your Holy Spirit guide us and may we never forget our place in working with you and doing your will and seeking your guidance in all things. We pray for those who are deployed, their families at home, and we pray for our world and we pray that you'll bring peace. May your spirit guide us in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. <laughs>
As we pray together, I want to draw your attention to verse Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. It says, Bring ye the full tithe into the storehouse. Uh, Test me on this, says the Lord God Almighty. See that I will open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out so many blessings that there will not be enough room to store it. Let's pray together. God, we acknowledge that all that we have is from you. We thank you so much for this church, for the opportunity to serve this community and places around the world. We ask that our tithes and offerings would bring you honor and glory and they would fulfill the mission of this place. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship with our First Baptist Church family here in beautiful uptown Columbus, Georgia. I'm grateful you've chosen to worship with us today as we think about how power speaks to truth. This is an important idea and it follows on the, uh, on the heels of what we talked about last week is where truth speaks to power, or speaking truth to power. So as you join us in this worship experience, I pray that the Holy Spirit will guide your thinking too. If you have prayer requests, let us know about them and let us join you in those prayers. And if there are other ministries that we may offer to you, let me know. As you look for a church home, we would love to be the church home for you. There's so many things going on here, so many missional projects underway, that there's a place for you to plug your gifts and your talents in to serve the Lord. Thank you for being a part of today, and may God bless you. You bless us by your presence. Thank you.
Thank you. That was beautiful. As you take your Bibles and look in 1 Kings chapter 2, you'll find part of the text in chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. The second part of the text is in 3, uh, 1 Kings 3, verses 3 through 14. 1 Kings 2, 10 through 12, and then 3, 3 through 14. Then David rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. He had reigned 40 years over Israel, 7 years in Hebron, and 33 in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his rule was firmly established. And then in chapter 3, verse 3. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, You've shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I'm only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased with what Solomon had asked. So God said to him, Since you've, not asked, since you've asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice. I will do what you've asked, and I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I'll give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you'll have no equal among kings." And if you walk in obedience to me, keep my decrees and commands as your father David did, I'll give you a long life. It's a beautiful passage. It's where we see God and Solomon in an intimate conversation. And we're privileged to step into that moment and to overhear what's going on. It was a transparent moment. Now, what fascinated me about this is last week, you know, we talked about speaking truth to power. And we talked about the importance of how um, when we speak truth to power, it takes integrity and boldness and faith and strength. It's quite a risk, actually, because it could cost the individual dearly when the individual speaks truth to power. But when we speak truth to power, knowing that truth is from God we become free. We are freed from the tyranny and intimidation and threats of life. In other words, when you speak in the name of the Lord, it changes so many of the rules there. And it's hard to be intimidated when you're speaking for God. We are, in essence, at that moment, doing the right thing for the right purpose to effect a just end in the confidence that we're doing what we do in the name of the Lord. So it's for the right reason. Now, in order to fully grasp the gravity of the passage this morning, let me put this idea of power and truth in context. There's a collection of writings that we call the Apocrypha. You'll see sometimes in a bookstore you'll find a Bible that will have the Bible with the Apocrypha or... Uh, with those uh, uh, books that are accepted in some areas and not in others. But what we learn from them, even though they're not a part of our canon, a part of the Bible we use, 
you still have stories in it that teach us lessons, and sometimes they're moral lessons. And there's a little book called First Ezra. And in First Ezra, chapters 3 and 4, there's a story of King Darius, and you remember him from the Old Testament, uh, the king of Persia. And King Darius has a great party, and he calls in all of the governors from 127 provinces, all the way from India to Ethiopia. Think of the scope of that. He calls all of those governors in, and they all sit down, and they feast together, and they enjoy the time. And then there are four young men who are leaders within his um, house, and they kind of are jockeying for who gets to be the greatest in that. And so there is a decision that's made that there will be a contest between those four young men. Now what the young men are supposed to do is they're supposed to uh, state in just a few words what is real power in this world. What is the most powerful thing in the world? Now the way they were to do it is they were to write it down and slide it under the king's pillow at night, and then when he got up the next morning, he was supposed to find those pieces of paper or whatever and read them and decide who was the wisest and who deserved to, as, it put, as they put it, sleep on gold, drink from a gold cup, wear a gold chain, and be called cousin to the king. So it was supposed to be somebody who was elevated within the politics of the palace if they were considered to be the wisest. So the king got up the next morning, and they had to be pretty shrewd to be able to get those under the pillow without waking the king up. Or maybe it was just one of those parties, I'm not sure. But what happened was, when the king woke up the next morning, and he reached under his pillow, and he found the little slips of paper. On the first one, he read, and he called in the young man, and he said, I want you to defend your position. And so the young man came in, and what he'd written was, it was three words, Wine is, or four words, wine is the strongest. Wine is the strongest. And he defended it by saying, you know what wine can do to a person. It can make them more sociable in places, and at the same time, it can raise anger. It can spawn fights among people, or it can make them forget everything, their families and everything else. He said the effects of that can be both enhancing or devastating and so he said it is such a powerful thing that I have to say that's the strongest the second one wrote the king is strongest now given that this is something the king's going to decide he's playing to his base right here so he says oh king you're the one who's the real strongest here and so he's called in and said defend your position and so he says well you have the power of life and death over people. You can call people to your bidding. You can wage war against people or you can broker peace. You have the greatest power. The farmers brought forth their increase and bore it as a tribute to you, O king. You are the greatest. What could be stronger than such power? The third, when, he, when his little paper was written... He was called in to explain his. His words were, women are the strongest. He may have been playing to his base, I don't know. Women are the strongest. And he said, you know, wine may be strong, the king may be strong, but remember who bore the king. If it hadn't been for the woman, the king wouldn't even be here. So the women are the strongest. And said, you know, when a man falls in love with a woman, he leaves his family, and he goes and marries her and lives with her. And many have gotten, uh, have had their lives changed by the relationship with a woman for good and even for bad. Women by far are stronger than wine or the king. And the fourth one wrote, truth is the strongest. And he said, in defense of that proposition, he told the judges, how all the earth called upon truth, how heaven had blessed truth, how evil works tremble in the presence of truth. He said, wine and kings and women are strong, and, but they are fallible. But all of them perish in the end. Truth endureth forever. She's a source of justice and order. She is strength and kingdom and power and majesty in all ages. 
when he'd finished, all the people shouted, Great is truth. So he's the one that won the contest. But bringing forth this idea of the power of truth is really important. Because what we understand is that ultimate truth is from God. That God is. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in understanding that, we find Solomon in this particular account where he has become king. If you read that first section there with me in chapter 2, you see that it states that David rested with his ancestors. That's a euphemism for he died. That's what it means. He rested with his ancestors. And because of that, Solomon was elevated to king. And when Solomon was elevated to king, he had choices to make there. What do you do when you wake up one day and someone says, your dad's dead, you are now the king. What goes through your head? Oh, well, I want to do this. Well, bow down to me, honor me. What comes to mind when you suddenly realize that overnight you have become the ultimate power? What goes through your mind? When people come into the room, do you expect them to treat you differently? Do you expect things to happen in a different way? When you speak, do you expect people just to go and do without any controversy at all or conversation? It's a good question. So when he became king, when Solomon became king, he became essentially the symbol of power. God is a symbol of truth. Solomon is a symbol of power. And it was P.J. Bailey who wrote in a book that prayer is spirit speaking truth, little t, to truth, big T. Big T being God, little t being what we speak to God because it is fallible at times. But when you think about Solomon and you think about what he is going to have to say in this conversation, he, all of the truth in his life could be overshadowed and even wise decisions could be overshadowed by the fact that he had a title now. He was now the king. The title royal is something that in all honesty carries power, but you know what? It's a human designation. It is not a designation that God particularly gives. And we need to be wise enough to know that even a king answers to a greater power. Even someone who thinks their power is ultimate answers to a greater power. And so that's part of what we see. So the conversation between God and Solomon is emblematic of, of that particular truth. So now, go back to the account with me for just a second. In verse 5, it talks about, in chapter 3, verse 5, it talks about where Solomon has gone to offer a sacrifice at Gibeon. In the night, God appears to him, and the question is really a simple question. Ask for whatever you want me to give to you. Imagine God coming to you and asking you that. If you were like me when I was growing up, you know, the little genie stories where you rub the bottle and the genie comes out and I'll give you anything you want. Our minds go wild about what would you want in a situation like that. This is the God of the universe who in this particular moment, and it's unique, comes and offers for anything to give anything to Solomon that he asks. What's missing in this adds power to the moment and adds weight to the moment gravity to it, if you please, God didn't put any restrictions on it. Tell me what you want me to do. He didn't say, now as long as it's good and doesn't hurt people, He didn't say, as long as it remembers others and makes society better. He didn't say, these are the parameters, these are the restrictions, you can't go over this line here, over this line here, there are certain things I won't do. God said, I'll do whatever you ask. And so Solomon is given a blank check from heaven. Tell me what you want. Does your mind go kind of wild when you think about that? As I read it, Solomon's invited to ask for whatever his heart desired. But the, pre the, the impressive part to me is that Solomon responded with a sense of humility. 
with all that had been thrust upon him at a young age, with all that was potential in the promises that were made by the people when they named him king, with everything that's in place, Solomon keeps his head about him and approaches God with humility. You might note that he bases it on the fact that he was reared right, that his dad had given him good instructions and he was honoring God with that. You notice that it says that in the honoring of God, he tried to walk in the way that he had been taught. That's there. So Solomon wasn't coming to this moment cold. It was something that was already a part of the makeup of his life. What he said was, in verse 9, So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who's able to govern such a great people? You know, this is sort of the opposite of what you see in Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned. The idea was they, were gonna, they did not know good and evil. All they knew was good. And when they ate the fruit, they would know evil really quickly. Here Solomon recognizes that he's going to have to be the one who stands as judge, stands as arbiter, stands as the one to govern a people, stands as the one who has to make decisions, and his decisions are going to either be based on self-serving interests and approaches, or for the good of the people. Will he be a good king or a bad king? Will he follow God or will he not? Those are the questions that are just churning at this moment. How different is this from a person who receives a blessing from God and in the middle of that or asks God, please help me with this, help me with this, and God does, and then they turn around and say, God, I've got it now. I'll take it from here and when I need you again, I'll call you. Solomon invites God in this moment into the journey of his monarchy. He invites him into that. Now, in all fairness, Solomon lost his way before the end of his time. But at this particular point, he teaches us something. You know, some of the greatest leaders I've known through the years, and I've been privileged to know people off and on just because... Whenever we would talk, whether it was in industry or politics or whatever, whenever we had a chance to have those little private conversations to the side, and I talked to them about how they felt when they suddenly ascended to that position or received that promotion or whatever, or when we've talked about what happened in their lives that changed, they'd say, you know, when something happened, when I came to this moment, I felt this profound sense to go and ask God for help in knowing how to do what I'm about to have to do. Those were the great leaders. Those were the great leaders. The ones who just saw it as something that they had achieved in life never achieved the pinnacle of success that could have been theirs had they surrendered that moment to the Lord and said, you guide me, you teach me, you give me wisdom. Let me always remember that I answer to you when it comes to a decision that I make, that the title doesn't give me the power, it's the relationship with you that gives me the wisdom. That's the key. The Bible is clear, too, that this moment did not weaken Solomon. What does God say? Because of what you've asked, you ask a humble thing. And there are things you didn't ask for. You could have asked me to annihilate all your enemies. Hey, I offered. You could have asked me to give you the greatest wealth the world has ever seen. Hey, I offered, but you didn't ask for it. You could have asked for long life. Hey, I offered. You didn't ask for that. All you asked for, bud, was to be wise and to know the difference between right and wrong. And then God pauses and says, and I'm pretty impressed with that. So he said, because of that, I'm going to give you not only what you asked for, but I'm going to give you things you didn't ask for. And I think they grew directly out of that humble experience. If you have that kind of wisdom, then you know how to appropriately make the wealth happen. You take care of yourself and you have the long life. You have these other things. God says, we can do something with a heart that's that surrendered to me. 
That's what humility does in our lives. So he says, you're not going to be weaker. You're going to be stronger. It's always bugged me that people thought of Christians as kind of wimpy. You know? That always bothered me. There's a little boy that somebody asked, said, said, describe what a Christian is like. He said, well, Christians are mild. They're weak. They're quiet people who never fight or talk back. And then he paused a moment and he says, you know, my dad's a Christian, but my mom isn't. (laughs) He got in a lot of trouble for that. But anyway, but following that idea, what it says is that it is not that we become weak, but that we put aside the things that would draw us away from what's right. What is more powerful, to have ultimate authority or be able to know the difference between right and wrong? What's more powerful, to have great wealth or to know what's right and wrong? What is greater, to have long life or to have the wisdom to use every minute of the life we have? You see, in the Bible, Christians are courageous and powerful and outspoken and surrendered to God. And we're called to be obedient to His will, to be cooperative with God's purposes, to be submissive in God's direction, and to be committed to God's cause. That's where we are called as individuals. And in short, it means that the person that that we need to remember with whom we're speaking. We're speaking with truth. We're speaking with the God of the universe. Solomon could not overestimate his power or underestimate who he was speaking with. You know, the Scripture kind of foreshadows at this moment how things would be. Jesus would come into this world, and what does the Scripture say? He humbled himself took on the form of a servant, even though he was incarnate God. Philippians 2.7. In a very real way, that servant leadership. We learn it from the humility that seeks wisdom, and out of that grows everything else. You know, some of you will instantly recognize the name Quincy Jones, the, the uh, record producer, performer, composer, promoter, director, arranger, that guy. Do you remember the song he produced, We Are the World? Do you remember that? We are the world, we are the people, you know. It was, I think it was for a cause for Africa or something of that nature. And what he did, the magic of it was, he assembled actors and actresses and performers from all across the spectrum. Back in 1985, I think it was. He brought them all together. He got them to sing together. He produced this song, and the proceeds of that they used to help support this cause in Africa. It was interesting. In that song, there were like 40 different people, or maybe more than that, who were involved. But in one account of it, it says, Lionel Richie, Stevie Wonder, Paul Simon, Kenny Rogers... James Ingram, Tina Turner, and Billy Joel sang the first verse. Then Michael Jackson and Diana Ross followed up, completing the first chorus together. Deanne Warwick, Willie Nelson, Al Jarreau did the second verse before Bruce Springsteen and Kenny Loggins, Steve Perry, and Daryl Hall go through the second chorus. And the co-writer, Michael Jackson, along with Huey Lewis and Cindy Lauper and Kim Carnes, followed the song's bridge, and it came to the stirring conclusion when Bob Dylan came in and Ray Charles, you know, and Wonder and Springsteen became involved. Now, listen to that. It is easier to contain a nuclear explosion than to bring that many performers together and have them cooperate. Think about it. These are people who, when they go perform, have to have, you know, red delicious apples with the stems turned up right in their rooms. These are the ones that have to have a certain kind of water in there or a certain kind of whatever in place that when they stand on stage, everybody else has to stand behind them and the light has to hit them a certain way from their good side. This is the kind of ego you're dealing with with a lot of these people. 
And he brought all of those together in one place, got them to sing a song together for one purpose. People were astounded. And Quincy Jones doesn't have a little ego himself. And they said, how did you do it? He said, at the entrance to the recording studio, I posted a little song, a little sign, and it said, check your ego at the door. And he told them, don't come in here with that stuff. Check your ego at the door. When God and Solomon met, Solomon checked his, his uh, kingly nature, his, um, his uh, royal crown at the door. He parked it, his ego there. When God came into that moment, he parked his divine nature at the door. And the two of them sat down and talked. It's beautiful. In fact, it's exactly what Jesus came, did when he did come, and he did walk with us and talk with us and teach us. And in the conversation, God in that moment said, Look, I'll do anything to help you. What can I do for you? What do you want? And Solomon looked at him and said, To be honest with you, the thing I need more than anything else is wisdom because I don't know what I'm doing. And God said, I will give you that and more. When we talk to God, we check our egos at the door. We speak to God from the humility of our hearts. And God offers us the wisdom to use the opportunity that he's given to us. And if we believe that we need to serve the Lord, we must surrender the moment. We must follow him. We must cooperate with God's will and invest our faith and love in this God the first place any of us should go in a victory or opportunity is to say, God, how do I handle this? The first place we should go when we have a trying situation is to God and say, God, how do I deal with this? And the prayer we end up praying is, just give me wisdom for good or for bad, for success or failure, for disappointment or for pleasure. Give me wisdom and walk with me through it. Because the victories we have then will always be in the name of the Lord and will be lasting. Amen. Will you bow with me as we pray? Spirit of God, as we bow before you, we pray that you will lead us in all things in life. Lead us not as people that have to be dragged kicking and screaming to keep up with you. But may it be the most delightful, blessed thought of our hearts to think that we are following you and that you are guiding us and that we are asking you for wisdom in how to use whatever power or influence or whatever we are given in this world. Help us to remember that power in this world is temporal. It does come to an end. Truth from you is eternal and we abide in it forever. Give us wisdom to know the difference. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our invitation hymn is hymn 68. He leadeth me, O blessed thought. Think about that. Instead of kicking and screaming, we go as a delightful experience with God. We check our egos at the door, and we follow Him. As you stand and as you sing this, Think about the commitments you make to the Lord, to accept Him as Savior, to rededicate your life, to become a part of the church. Whatever it is God's leading you to, that's your moment, and I'll meet you at the front as we stand and sing.
Thank you for being a part of worship this morning. As you go from this place, I pray that God will bless you in every way possible. I pray God will empower you and give you opportunity and influence and strength. I pray that God will give you success and will allow you to make a difference within this world. I pray that you will be so fulfilled that it will be to overflowing and that the first thing you do is bow before the Lord and ask His blessing and His wisdom and humbly surrender to Him. In the name of Jesus, amen.